You are listening to the podcast When Life Gives You Lemons, presented by me, Emma Levy. Having worked with elite athletes for most of my career, it's always intrigued me that a significant number of high-performing individuals have encountered some form of adversity earlier in their lifetime. My fascination into this grew when I had my own brush with adversity when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2020 in the midst of the global pandemic at the age of 36. During this period, I questioned whether it was my positive mindset or maybe something deeper which enabled me to bounce back and to train and compete for a triathlon just one month following completion of all active cancer treatment. The goal of this podcast is to explore this concept further by meeting a variety of high-performing individuals who have experienced adversity but who have come back stronger. Today, I am welcoming Martine Wright, MBE, to the podcast. On the 7th of July, 2005, Martine found herself on the Circle Line Tube travelling to Aldgate Station. That morning, she was late to work and so sat in a different carriage to normal. As she sat and read the paper, she was unaware she was sitting just three feet away from a suicide bomber. Martine was one of the worst injured survivors following the 7-7 terrorist attack in London. She lost both her legs, 80% of her blood, and waited one and a half hours to be extrapolated from the chaos by the rescue workers that day. With life-changing injuries, some individuals may have given up, but not Martine. Following a one-year stay in hospital, intensive rehabilitation and multiple surgeries, she went on to become a sitting volleyball player, representing Team GB in the London 2012 Paralympic Games. Martine is now a wife, mother, motivational speaker, charity ambassador, and has even gained a pilot's license. And in the words of her website, Martine is living testament to how catastrophic life changes can have positive outcomes. And this is the premise of this podcast. So I really am honoured to have you here today, Martine. Thank you very much. No problem. So can we take it back to that morning where you overslept and it was a cruel twist of fate, maybe a sliding doors moment? Will you tell us what happened? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, I can't quite believe it's it's eight, well, 19 years ago. And it was sort of a normal morning. I mean, yeah, if anyone remembers the 7th of July, which I'm sure many people will, they might remember the 6th of July, 2005. And that was the day that we all found out that London had won the Olympic bid. I am probably here for my accent. I'm a proud Londoner. Um, I am actually a Bowbell Cockney. I was born um, in the sound of the Bowbells. So uh, for a huge, huge sporting event to come back to to where I was born, pretty much East London, um, I was kind of excited. And I remember that was my last working memory was jumping up and down at work in jubilation, uh, cuddling my colleagues and my friends saying, London has won, London has won. And then I proceeded to go out that night and have a few celebratory jars. um, And then, yeah, woke up that morning. And yeah, I I was slightly late for work because I'd had so many celebratory jars the night before. Um, And yeah, it was a normal morning. I remember running down my stairs in my flat in in um in Crouch End and I remember you know getting on that first train and then finally getting to the escalators at Moorgate tube station and I remember I was always one of those people that I couldn't st- stand still in an escalator I don't know what that says about me um but I was running I was running up of it and I, I turned to my right and I remember the feeling I remember the feeling of relief of oh brilliant my tube is there my tube is there and um yeah ran on the first carriage I I I saw and then proceeded to start my journey and like many many people on the tube that morning like every morning really um you're not aware of who's around you what what you know what's going to happen who gets on who gets off but what I do distinctly remember thinking before the explosion happened after Liverpool Street is I started reading my paper and obviously that morning you couldn't turn a page without reading something on the on the Paralympics and Olympics and I remember the explosion happened I remember a big white flash in in front of my eyes and I I often liken it to um a cartoon character like Tom and Jerry I'm, I'm not too sure whether I'm too old now and people don't remember Tom and Jerry but um <laughs> but uh you know, when someone, when a character hits the other one with a saucepan, I, I felt like that. I felt like I was being thrown from side to side. Um, but before that explosion happened, I remember sitting in my seat and reading that paper and looking up from this paper and going, I've got good tickets to this. 
this is going to be massive. The Olympics are going to be massive. In, in my hometown, I've got to get tickets. I didn't get a ticket. You talk about a sliding doors moment. I believe that was. And it wasn't five years later. It wasn't six years later. But my lucky number, which I wear on my shirt now, is number seven. And it was seven years later that I didn't need a ticket. I took part. And um, something people say things happen for a reason. And I can only believe that that is true. Yeah. But the bombing happened, like we said, nearly 19 years ago. How does it feel now having that day recounted? It's still, obviously, it's still painful when when you think of it. I mean, you know, obviously, 18 years on, you know, I think, well, you've probably seen this interview, that I do laugh and I joke a lot. And I think it's a great healer. You know, Emma, I'm sure what I've known from you this morning and what, you know, I reckon you've got a very good sense of humour. And, um, you know, I do laugh and I joke, but the last 18 years has been a roller coaster. You know, I have to be honest, you know, from days when me and my family, I mean, you know, eight days after I was put in a coma, my family searched for me for nearly three of them. Um, and, you know, it, it it was absolutely, obviously, life-changing. Um, but as time has gone on, obviously, psychologically, physically, emotionally, I've got stronger about it. And I think I do have a quite a unique experience of that morning. I think, I think, I think many people will remember memories from, from that day. And, um, you know, most of my memories from that day is from you know, hundreds of foot down in, in Orgate tube station. And, you know, the people that risked their lives that day in order to, to save me and other, other, other fellow passengers. So do you, do you have memories from that day? Yeah, I remember everything. I mean, again, uh, you know, people really? say, were you, were you knocked out? And I said, well, I might, I might have been for a couple of, a couple of minutes or maybe a minute when the first, but no, I mean, the, as I said, the explosion happened. I don't remember a noise. I talked with other people from that day, and they remember a huge bang. I don't remember a noise. I remember a flash in front of my eyes, but a huge flash. And I remember thinking, and again, I can't believe I had enough time to think this, as that nanosecond of a flash m- must have happened when the bomb went off. But I remember this white light was in front of me, and I remember thinking, what the hell is going on? What is going on? And I can't believe I had enough time to think that. Um, anyway, what was going on was presented to me a nanosecond later. And, you know, I either, as I said, was knocked out for a couple of seconds, but I woke up or I opened my eyes and I was in something that obviously didn't look like a tube at all. And, you know, all I could hear was screams, um, I had uh, Andy, my fellow passenger behind me, um, um, uh, unbeknown to me, he was being electrocuted at the time because his head was out of the carriage. The carriage didn't look like a carriage anymore. For instance, you'll see a picture from that day, um, uh, a media picture from one of the tubes. And a lot of the time you see the tube that I was on where I was sitting. And well, how do I know that that's my tube? Because there was a huge crater in the side of the tube where I was sitting. And that was because I was sitting in the corner of the tube when the explosion happened. Yeah, the guy was only four foot away from me. But what happened was it hit the end of the tube where I was sitting and it rebounded. So I got the impact twice, really. And where I was sitting for many years in the beginning, I wasn't strong enough to look at any images or anything like that. And this is how my story has changed. And this is how I feel like I have a responsibility now to talk about it because there's not many people that go through that experience. And unfortunately, with the world that it is at the moment, um, you know, we're going to see terrorism again and again in our lives. Um, Mm. But I was going to ask you, why do you tell your story? Because I feel like I have a responsibility. I mean, in the beginning... Obviously, yeah, I was scared, like every, everyone would be. God, I, I woke up eight, after eight days and they had to tell me that both my legs had been amputated. I mean, you know, I was an international marketing manager. 
eight days before that, I was, mm. I was, you know, I'm not being funny, but a girl about town in London, you know, it was, you know, it was an unbelievable sort of change. And, and in the beginning, obviously, again, we, we all go through this when we go through things. And Emma, I know you've been through um, your own tragedy as well, but you ask that question. Do you know what that question is? Why me? Why me? Why yeah, me? I feel like I'm quite a nice yeah. person. I feel like I'm quite, you know, why? And, and you have to get through that. And, you know, and I did get through that. And, and now I feel like it is, as I said, my duty to talk about it. You know, I did remember everything that day. I didn't, you know, I remember you know, how I got out and who stayed with me and who held my hand. And I, I and didn't realise I'd lost 80% of my blood at that point, but I I remembered it. And, and, and I have had deep conversations, obviously, with my fellow club members. Let's call it the 7-7 seven, seven Club, yeah? Woo, 7-7 seven, seven Club. You would never yeah. really choose to belong to the 7-7 seven, seven Club, but it's an amazing club. It is the the understanding, the emotion, the connection you have with these people are amazing. And I remember the day that I realised, and this brought me to say, well, stop saying, why me? Why me? And that was the day that I found out how many people died that day. And it was very soon after I'd come out of my coma. I didn't realise. I mean, you know, at one point I thought we'd had a crash, obviously, a, a bomb hadn't really come into my 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 brain, my my vocab. Um, but yeah, I do remember it. Thing I was down there for an hour and a half, and and now I think I used to talk about my journey because I, I used to think it was quite cathartic, and I used to think, and I still think that if I can help one person out there that is struggling with with whatever they're going through and whatever ever, adversity change. You know, then for me to keep talking, um, you know, then that's that's worth it. All that pain and everything I've been through, if I can help people out there. Um, and that's why I talk about yeah. it. Yeah, You've answered the question I was going to ask, which was I was going to ask you, did you ever say, why me? And then if you did say, ask the question to yourself, why me? What was the turning point when it switched to what now? And you've actually answered that by saying it was when you realised that those 52 people lost their lives that day but how were you able to switch your mindset because that's not such an easy thing um i don't think it's necessarily one thing again is it you know with 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 people that go through um adversity or 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 a change but i think i used to feel quite guilty saying what i'm going to say now um in the beginning because i actually from when I found out that day how many people died that day. I found this coping mechanism, I suppose, one of them, because I believe all of us have to have many coping mechanisms to deal with this very unpredictable world that we live in. Um, and that coping mechanism was to compare myself with other people. So, and and I believe that... That, that actually that mindset actually took me on to do other things as well so as i said i never used to like to say this in the in in the beginning of my journey 18 years ago because i used to feel guilty i used to feel guilty saying that i will remember those 52 people that died i will remember their parents their mums and dads their wives their husbands that i have met at different stages I will remember those people. I was in hospital for a year with one of my very good friends now. I had no idea who she was in the beginning. But her name is, 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 is well, we, we, we're actually twins. They actually call us twins, but it's Jeanette. And Jeanette lost both her legs. She's black and I'm white, which is the funny part of it. We find very funny. Um, but, she, but she lost both her legs and both her arms through meningitis. Now... I used to take strength from her and I used to look at her or I used to think about those 52 people or I used to look about my mum or dad and they could have been one of their mums and dads that lost their daughters or sons that day. And I'd, I'd look at them and I'd go, 
it's never going to be that bad. It's never, I'm here. I'm a lucky one. I've got both my arms. Yeah. And that's really one of the first steps that got me through that thing of not going, why me? Why me? Um, there was that. And then obviously everyone thinks that, oh, everything's from inside. Yeah. It's, it's not. You know, I took strength from the love that I had, the love and support around me. And that was in the beginning from the brilliant NHS professionals that saved my life. You know, my, my, my surgeon that said no to meeting the Queen. Yes, the Queen did turn up two days after the, um, the bombings happened in London, which must have been a huge security alert. But bless her, she turned up to Royal London and, um, you know, she wanted to meet my surgeon. And, and and because she had been, she was the main plastic surgeon that was saving everyone's lives. But unfortunately, my surgeon didn't meet the Queen or her team because my surgeon tells me this. They, she said, um, she said that the Queen wants to meet you, and she said, no, sorry, uh, I've got to go and save Martine's arm. And um, I had a procedure on my arm; I could have lost my left arm as well. So she didn't meet the Queen that day, but she <laughs> saved my arm. Um, so. You know, it's it's different stages. But, yeah, as I said, I, I got the strength from outside as well. I got the strength from my mum yeah. grabbing hold of my face and saying, Martine, you're going to be okay. You're going to get new legs. You're, gonna, you're, you're still here. You're not dead. You're, you're, you haven't got a brain injury. You're still going to get new legs. Or, or my brother, you know, holding my hand and saying, Martine, I've got to tell you something, and I feel really guilty. And I said, what? What is it? And he said, out of me, you and Tracy, that's my brothers and sisters, and they're older than me, I think you have been chosen. I think you're the only one that is strong enough to deal with this. And just those words, just that belief, you know, gets you through helping you to ask, you know, not ask that question of why me, or it's happened, what am I going to do about it? Yeah. So you had an amazing support system. Um, and as a physiotherapist, I've worked with amputees. And actually, one of my earliest memories, it's quite interesting, of what inspired me to be a physio was when I was on work experience. I was like 16 and I spent the day in the um, orthopedic hospital. And I remember so clearly a 16-year-old um, amputee who'd lost his leg, I think, to bone cancer. Um, and I remember being, as a young girl, so inspired and motivated by his positive mindset um, as such a young boy. And, I, and that was one of the things that actually drove me down my physio, my physio path. But I also remember how difficult it is for you guys to learn how to walk again. It's, you know, it's bloody hard. So how did you come yeah. from that and a year stay in hospital, a year stay rehabilitation to participate in the Paralympics? Because that's quite a journey. So how did you stay strong in hospital for a year? And, and then how did you get on to the next part? Um, well, I think, again, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of factors why I, I decided, decided to stay strong. And, and I suppose, yeah, I realised in the beginning, when I realised how many people died that day, I realised I had choices. I had a choice. Because I survived, I had that, those choices. No idea what, what was going to happen uh, in my life, but... I had choices and Emma I didn't realize that you were a physio because that is I've got I mean I had yes respect for you anyway Emma but my god you guys are absolutely amazing <laughs> and I will talk about what you guys do and how that helped me the first yeah that I spent 366 days in the hospital yeah and it wasn't just about walking you know that Emma it was about building my life again it was about me accepting my body image it was about me accepting what had happened to my brain the memories that I had that day the people that I'd met you know why were there were less cries on the tube when when with an hour down and I can only you know think that that was people dying and, and just to deal with that um is a hell of a lot and I think this is where you guys are bloody brilliant because you are you guys are not just a physio yeah you are 
that first person that sees you every morning. You are that shoulder to cry on. You are that person to hold my hand to say, I can't do it. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do it. I don't want to get out of bed. No, you, you will, you will. And Emma, I'm sure you did this with your um, patients. I'm sure you, you still do. Um, but it's not just about putting one foot in front of the other. And yes, it is. Oh, my God, it's ridiculously hard um, to learn to walk. I mean, you know, I, I have friends saying to me now, you know, still now on my prosthetic legs, I fall over. Um, and that's a regular occurrence. I mean, the advantage, I have to look at the positive, I know how to fall over now, even though I thought I didn't know how to fall over, if you know what I mean. But I know how to fall, fall I relax and I, I fall down. Although the funny thing is that my old friends, and they are old now, because we're all old. No, no, I'm joking. But my old friends from school used to say, well, no wonder you can fall. You know, you know how to fall. You've always f- fallen. You know what I mean? You only two prosthetic legs. You've always just been one of those people that fall all over the place. Um, but yeah, to have, again, you know, it's, I, I have both my legs amputated above the knee. So, so knees is a huge thing, huge thing in walking, you know. Um, but I am lucky, lucky enough. I'm looking at my, my ankles now. They're right in front of me. I don't have them on at the moment, my prosthetic leg. But I, I am lucky to say that I've got the, one of the best, best legs in the market. Um, which <laughs> I never used to be able to say that. It's a bit like now I go, ladies and gentlemen. I have the thinnest ankles in the world. I always wanted that. And now I have them. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yeah, how did I go from that? So again, it was, it was a process. It was, you know, people say, how, to, how, how did you get through that? How did, and it's a process of ups and downs. Not everything is like that. And you need those downs in order to appreciate the ups. But Yeah, in the beginning, it was support from you and the expertise of people like you, you know, pushing me on and, and, you know, giving me that shoulder to cry on and and all those things. And also as well, Emma, this is why your physios, anyone, NHS are brilliant because it's not just about the patient, is it? You know, you support your patient in hospital, but it's their pet, it's their mum and dad. It's their sister and brother. Oh my God, my mum and dad were like, my daughter's just been blown up. How how am I going to deal with that? You know, Emma or my my physio is Maggie. Maggie. And um, you'll laugh at this again, mm-hmm. Emma. Well, hopefully you will. Maybe people will. Uh, Maggie's surname used to be Udom. And she has taught amputees to walk for 25 years. She now recently has married um, her lovely, lovely uh, husband. And his name is Mr. Walker. So now her name is Mrs. <laughs> Walker. And she has taught people to walk for 25 years. But, but I remember, I know, I, I remember when, when uh, in my, at my marriage and, and my, my wedding day, and I remember before that, Maggie saying to me, Maltine, I need to get you a present. We need to get you a nick a present. What are we going to get you? And I sort of looked at her as if she was mad and went, you are mad you gave me the best best present in the world and that was the gift of walking so uh, i don't want anything I, you, you know um so yeah there was that and then yeah she pushed me on a lot of people pushed me on the, 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 you know whether that was psychological yeah. support i got from expertise whether that was other patients you know and i did feel like when i was in hospital yeah. i had a job to do and that job I believe I might have been more physically injured, but I think I was stronger. I think I was psychologically stronger compared to other patients, other victims of that day. And as a result, I felt like I had a job to do. I felt like I had to go around and hold people's hands and talk about it and look them in the eyes and say, we're going to be okay. We are going to, it's going to be tough, but we're going to be okay. And so I believe that empowered me to go on. But really it was Maggie that, that said, look, love, you need to do something. What are you going to do? And I went off to an amputee games where, you, again, you, you know, there's loads of people there with legs and arms missing, which is, which is powerful in itself, obviously. Um, and then I tried all different sports, but I fell in love with sitting volleyball. And hence why uh, I started volleyball when Oscar was only three months old. Um, and that was only three years before the Paralympics. And, yeah. I 
ended up going to the Paralympics and one of the best, best, best things from it was to go back to my hometown. I, I left London after I got blown up. It was too hard to stay in London. I left and I love London. It's a big, big part of my life. And to be able to go back on one of the most celebrated days and see my family and my friends up in, that, in, that, in the crowds and say, look, guys, we've done this together. Look what we've done. And we're back. We're back in London. Yeah, I was going to ask, how, do, how did that feel? I'm fascinated how that felt for you for that first match, walking out for that first match in the London Paralympic Games. Do you still remember how that felt? Oh, yeah. I mean, I will never, ever forget that. I've, I've got goose- I've not even spoken about it now. You just spoke about it and I've got goosebumps. Um, yeah, that was absolutely huge. I mean, you know, the night before was the opening ceremony of, of the Paralympics as well. And, you know, even in that, there was so much connection um, between the 7th of July bombings and, you know, us, London, wanting, uh, winning the, the Olympic um, and, and Paralympic bit. And, and you know, I, I just remember... Going into this 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 stadium of sort of you know eighty thousand people going mad, and it was surreal. It was just surreal. And I remember walking around next to my teammate, going, "Oh my god, I just I feel like I'm waving manically." You know, it it, it it was just it was mad, and it really reminded me of all those people like yourself, Emma, who is physio, like who who have picked me up and pushed me on or wrapped me up and tied me together and said we you know we can do this you can do this we can do this and you know to be able to have that that I mean that morning to see my family and our first ever game was against the Ukrainian women actually how times have changed they were they were number three in the world uh at that point and yeah I, I you know I mean the funny thing about that day was because always a funny thing about a day remember that look for the funnies um is is basically biggest crowd we'd ever played to at that point right was about 400 people and that was in um holland at the europeans we were now walking out of a tunnel in xl arena in london in front of about five thousand people and that's why i will never ever forget that morning i remember coming out of this tunnel and the nerves and the excitement and and just the noise, the noise and support. You know, I could hear my name being, ch- I mean, it was mad. And I looked over to my left and I saw, and I have this picture. I have this picture that's in my hallway. Actually, it's not in this room, but I can go and get it. I'll, I'll show you after. Um, and it is a picture of my family. And Oscar is on my husband's head, Nick. Uh, on his shoulders and he's got this sign going go mummy go and 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 i knew that all the blood sweat and tears literally and the guilt the guilt of leaving your family for days on end weeks on end sometimes going train because it is really intense really intense um but i knew i knew that morning that all the blood sweat and tears had had all been worth it and and that is my favorite photo from the paralympic people say to me you know, you were pictured quite a lot within it. What What is your picture? And I said, this is my one. And they go, yeah, but you're not in it. And I'm like, I oh, know. That's why it's my, my picture. It's, it's, it's what it was all about, you know? Yeah. And I hear, I've heard you say you feel lucky to be living this dream now. If you could go back in time, would you change it? No, absolutely not. No, Emma, you could give me your time machine this morning. I'm not going to get in your time machine. No, I'm not, because my life now is enriched. I mean, it really is enriched. And, and maybe that's from what I've experienced. Maybe that's because I feel like I've gone the full circle, you know, leaving London, coming back to London. Maybe that's to do with the people that I meet through my job, yeah? And, and, and that is obviously through volleyball, but it's also through talking and and you know i am a speaker now and you know what people share with me is such an honor is 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 you know and again if i can say something in a speech for 40 minutes that you know um gives someone an opportunity to say i i want to share this i haven't shared this with anyone 
but I'm going to go up to Martine at the end. I'm not going to put my hand up in front of 200 people, obviously, but I am going to share this with her after. And that honour, that that uh, that investment that they those people have put in me, you know, is is absolutely huge. And again, you know, if I can help many people out there, just just with one thing in their life, then. Um, to me, to me, it's all worth it. But, um, I'm fascinated by that because I've spoken to obviously a lot of people on this podcast who say the same thing as you. They wouldn't want to reverse the traumatic incident that they've been through because they feel that their life is enriched. And it, I find it so inspiring. And it's, yeah, it's amazing to hear that. So thank you. No, no, it's all right. I mean, it's that acceptance, I think, as well. It's, it's, it's you know, if someone, you know, someone might go, all right, well, take me back to 24 hours and I'll run for that bus because this, these are the things I was a bit obsessed with in the beginning. I was, I, I was obsessed with two, two images. One was someone running for a bus because I always used to run up escalators, run for a bus. Or the other, the other thing was looking at people walking along the road with ease on their phone. Now, I can't do that now, you know, Emma, being, being a physio, I, I can't do that with two prosthetic legs. I, I, you know, everything. I'm concentrating the whole time to see where I am. Um, and But I think those two memories spurred me on in order to accept what had happened to me because you mentioned that I can fly. I, I can fly a plane. You know, I did about 60 hours flying in South Africa which was kind of distracting when you're flying over blue whales and giraffes and elephants. Yeah, it's mad, it's mad. But why did I do that? Well, I think, I, I think in the beginning, I convinced myself I wanted to do it because I've always wanted to fly. Yeah, maybe. But now I look back and why did I jump out of a plane at 12,000 foot? You know, why, why, why did I do that? And it was all to do with me thinking I might not be able to do that. I might not be able to run for that bus anymore like you, or I might not be able to, you know, um, do, do, you know, do whatever. But do you know what I can do? I can fly a plane. I can jump out of a plane. Have you done that? No, 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 you've not done that. You know, and I think it was... It was about the other. Emma, I reckon you might have jumped out of a plane. I, was I like, reckon you I've, might I've have jumped, jumped out of a plane. I haven't flown oh, a plane. There we I go. have jumped out of a plane. <laughs> Yeah, of course I have. <laughs> I knew, I knew you were going to say that. Well, exactly. So exactly. it's, 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 and again, would you have done that seven years ago? You know, if you hadn't been through what what you've been through, or spoken with people that you've spoken spoken to, or you know, it's it is mad. Do you think you've always been a resilient person, or do you think you your resilience, your grit, has developed since? since the bombing i think there's a bit of both there definitely i think again life isn't simple is it it's like it's never one thing um it's always a matter of of many many things and many experiences and, and what part of your life you know you experience that but yeah i mean i've had friends say to me and family well even what my brother said you know in in the beginning which was you know i think that out of three siblings you're the one that is strong enough for this. You're, you're, you have been chosen. Me and Tracy are not strong enough, you know. And yeah, it's that, it's that belief. But I think I've always had that glass is half full and a half empty. And I joke, except when I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm in a pub. One thing, um, Emma, now that I have a double MPT, either I'm in my wheelchair or on my prosthetic legs, no one. See, these are small wins for me. No one asked me to go to the bar to get a round of drinks. Again, that's a small win. <laughs> big win. Life is about, yeah, no, I know, I know. I know it's a big win. Big win <laughs> but life is about those little, those little, little wins. So, yeah, I think I've always been quite uh, resilient. I think, you know, where did I get that from? I don't know. I mean, my, my mum and dad um, got divorced after 27 years. Maybe that was a part of my resilience. Maybe you know a big part of my resilience as well was losing one of my best friends two years before the uh, explosions happened before the terrorist bombs happened uh in an awful awful tragic accident and you know again she has been very much in my mind in my heart over the last 20 years you know and you know she may not be here but that's one person that's really got me through and 
it's just all those things, it's all those coping mechanisms, and they change, don't they? As as life goes on, I think that some of those coping mechanisms change. But I do think now in the world, I think the advantage of maybe the last three years, good old COVID, has has taught us obviously to communicate through through platforms like this. But I truly believe that we're all having micro conversations at the moment. I believe there's a huge empathy that wasn't there three years ago. And, you know, I believe that we would still be fighting, hugely fighting the pandemic if we hadn't done it together. And that togetherness as a world, as a country, as a community, whatever, you know, I joke now and say, I, I, I never used to know my neighbors three years ago. I can't move. I, I can't move now. I've got neighbours knocking on my door. You know, we have we have coffee and sandwiches every Saturday morning. It's like, you know. Um and and that's an advantage. That's looking at the world and saying or looking at our lives and saying, Okay, I've been through this, yeah, or we've been through this as a world, but you know, if you really look at stuff, there is good things. Yeah, and, I, th- I, you know. I think from from talking to you, I've it's very evident how important community is to you and how much strength you've got from the people around you, which has also come up previously on these on these podcast chats, and that how important it is to take the strength from from our communities and from the people around us. Yeah. Um, we do have to bring this to a close, unfortunately. I could talk to you all day, but I always finish with a final question. If you could go back in time to when things were at their toughest, what do you wish you could have told yourself? Uh, I would, at, at, at my toughest, I would say um, that it will get better. It will get better. Would you have believed yourself? Depends what stage. It depends in the beginning. No, right in the beginning. No, how how, how is it going to get better? I'm half a person. I was I was I was looking at my body. And suddenly there was nothing there. Suddenly, suddenly it, there was a drop in the in the little waffle blankets that you get in 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 the hospital, and that image is still in my head. Um, but it's it's believe you know. And this is what I say to people when people share their their most deepest thoughts with me, you know, and their most deepest fears, and say, "I promise you, it will get better." And I I know it's not the same, but I have been been there. I I was there. Uh, you know, it might not have been for the same reasons, but I'm here now. And I promise you, it won't be like this, but it will be like that. And it will get better. And it's it's that belief. I mean, one of my mantras, I, ha- I haven't got that on today. I've got Nike on today. But um, I do have a sweatshirt that says <laughs> anything, anything is possible as long as you believe. And, and that is what life is about, whether it's belief in yourself, whether it's belief in the people around you whether it's belief in what you do or it's about belief so yeah yeah that is a that's a great place to end thank you martine thank you for talking to us today you are an absolute role model beacon of hope shining light your positivity is it's unmatched and when i started this podcast i wanted to meet people who'd been through adversity but come back stronger i wanted to delve into their minds to see how they were able to come through the tough times as a more enriched version of themselves. And you are the absolute epitome of this. And I hope people listen to this episode and can be inspired by your story if they are going through their own difficulties, because you truly, truly do demonstrate that you can come out the other end better and stronger. And that is what the message that I'm trying to share on this podcast. So thank you. Thank you very much for speaking to us today, Marty. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma. Lovely, lovely to meet you. I really hope you enjoyed listening to that episode with Martine today. What an unbelievably inspiring woman. If you did enjoy it, please share it with your friends. Let's see how many people can listen to this episode. And please like it, rate it, review and subscribe to When Life Gives You Lemons. Thank you.